Thank you, uh, everyone, for being here today, um, and especially our, our guests here. Um, I, I think the first thing we should do is uh, adopt the agenda. Susie Dillon, thank you. Um, and the clerk just pointed out to me that we do have exactly quorum here today. So if any of the, uh, the full-time, the permanent members uh, need to leave, in fact, then quorum falls off. So, and that's, uh, that's uh, Robin, Susie, um, Peter, and I. That's right. When we have, uh, sorry. Sorry, yes, Susie, Gord, Peter, and I. Thank you very much. Anyhow, uh, just, just keep that in mind. <laughs> you need to go to the washroom or anything oh, like sorry. that. Um, so I um, move, with, uh, we have the uh, agenda adopted. So we have an update on the population growth strategy, provincial immigration strategy, and workforce strategy for the construction sector. Uh, and this briefing will also include information regarding the importance of the international student to post-secondary institutions. It's from the Department of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population, and uh, we have uh, three very capable witnesses here with us here today. And maybe what I'll get you to do is just to introduce yourself before we start any presentations for the record, and AV knows who's sitting where. Uh, maybe we'll start here with Cal. I'm Cal Whitnell, Director of Population and Settlement with Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Uh, Jeff Young, I'm the Director at the PEI Office of Immigration. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Hunter. I'm the Director of Workforce Development with the, the Department of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population. And I am going to start our slide, so. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, we, we talked about it a little bit. I think what we're going to do is wait till the end of the presentation for questions, and then we're going to go through in the similar fashion we've been doing. <laughs> I call it the Henderson Method, where we go and uh, <laughs> We, you get a question and a follow-up, and then everybody gets a chance, and we'll just uh, keep rotating. All right, so go ahead, Mary. Perfect. So thank you for the opportunity to come and present today. It, it is very timely discussion for today. We wanted to really talk about the structure of our department and um, what divisions we're made up of. We're a relatively new department of workforce, advanced learning, and population. And I think, you know, we, we note on the slides here the divisions that make up our department. So it is no surprise of having population and settlement, immigration, workforce development, and post-secondary education together in the same department. This vision is really about building a talent pipeline and creating a sense of belonging for residents in Prince Edward Island and making us a place where people want to live, work, learn, and work in a healthy and safe work environment. So today we're going to flow through um, the presentation based on the uh, questions that you had requested us. We'll start with an overview of immigration, international students. I will give an overview on workforce development and then we'll, we'll uh, finish the presentation with the population um, growth framework. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff to take us through the immigration slides. Great, thanks Mary. So. So I'm with the Department or the Office of Immigration here in PEI. So as you can see by this uh, this diagram, we we intersect with quite a few different groups around PEI. So obviously we're we're dealing with our newcomers to Prince of Rhode Island, our, our, our immigrants. Um, we're dealing with PEI employers, uh, the federal government of Canada, as well as our, our settlement service providers. So. Um, we do hold our immigration agreements with the federal government. Those would be our provincial nominee agreement, uh, the pro provincial nominee program agreement, as well as the Atlantic Immigration Program Agreement. So we administer those two programs here in Prince Edward Island. Um, we also provide guidance and support to island employers who are looking to address labor market needs through immigration. Um, we look at attraction methods, integration ret and retention methods with immigrant workers and entrepreneurs. And we promote and deliver pathways to permanent residents here in PEI. Um, Annually, our immigration pathways uh, provide immigration, our immigration programs provide pathways for about 2,000 families here in Prince Edward Island on an annual basis through our immigration programs. Um, and one of our key deliverables is we assist, as I said, we assist um, companies with recruitment of foreign talent when domestic talent is not available. Um, we assess the needs of employers, we educate them on the pathways to bring in foreign nationals, and then we obviously we nominate those, those foreign nationals uh, to be able to apply for permanent residency with the federal government of Canada. So that's just a little overview of what we do and, and who we deal with on a regular basis. We do a number of outreach activities uh, through our office. Um, 
we've done over 800, uh, we've engaged with over 800 individuals and companies throughout the last year. Um, we engage with island employers on one-on-one -on -one or also presentations. Um, we engage with our post-secondary institutions here in PEI. Um, all three of them, we're on a regular meeting basis with them. Um, we interact with our other government departments, settlement organizations, and as well as industry associations. So just an ex examples of some of the uh, associations that we've met with over the past year, uh, Tourism Industry Association, Construction Association, Home Builders Association, Aquaculture Alliance, as well as the Agricultural Sector Council. And the, a lot of those have, again, been one-on-one -on -one meetings, as well as structured presentations to their members on immigration pathways. Another one of the big uh, things that we that we do here is international recruitment activities. Many of you have probably read in the news over the last 9, 10, 12 months or so about some of the activities that we've we've undertaken, specifically with our with our colleagues in health. Um, we've done a number of recruitment missions to to Dubai, uh, French, uh, France, Belgium, Morocco, and we're up, uh, we have an upcoming mission to Singapore in the next week or so. Um, so through our engagement activities, we we determine. You know what kind of positions are in, in demand, um, what those uh, what those look like, what kinds of markets we might want to look at to go and do international recruitment activities. Um, once we've determined, you know, what employers want to be uh, a part of the activity, what kinds of, of positions they have available, um, and we've identified the target position, then we engage with the Canadian Embassy in that market to help promote the activity as well. So. So they'll help promote the, uh, the the mission. They will help us to source the space, the meeting space, and provide uh, support in those areas. So again, we've been to Dubai. Focus was healthcare, trucking, and manufacturing. Uh, our missions to France, Belgium, and Morocco have focused on francophone uh, immigration, specifically employers in healthcare, education, early childcare, and tourism. Um, and then the upcoming mission to Singapore will again focus on healthcare, trucking, and construction. As Mary said, we, we do deal with a lot with our international student population. So, um, you know, as we all know, the number of international students at our island institutions has been increasing over the last several years. Um, and with the rise in those numbers combined with the increase that many of these students have in staying in PEI, um, our office has worked closely with our island, island, with our island post-secondary institutions as well as the students themselves. Um, just for perspective, there's a lot of people that are involved in organizations that are involved with uh, international student population. The post-secondary institutions are responsible for recruiting international students themselves to their, to their institutions and to their programs. Study permits are issued by the federal government of Canada. Um, access to settlement supports are, uh, are basically administered by our department through our, our partnerships with uh, settlement organizations. Um, Mary's shop at Skilps PEI does some work in this area with regards to interventions uh, with workforce while they're in school and upon their graduation. Um, again, we want to provide these individuals, the international student population, with a sense of belonging from their arrival here in PEI. Um, and especially if they have a desire to stay here in PEI, we really want to promote that, uh, that sense of belonging. And some activities that are done there can be looked at through the study and stay program that Cal shop uh, is, is involved with. Um, our office comes into play primarily once they're ready to graduate. Uh, again, we go to the the, uh, finan or the financial, the post-secondary institutions, and we do presentations on those pathways to permanent residents. Um, and when they're ready to graduate, that's when they come to our office to seek those those pathways. And then again, once they're ready to apply for their permanent residence, that's where the federal government of Canada would would come back into play and approve those those applications. So again. Our office gets involved primarily once these individuals are ready to graduate. Um, we do a number of, of outreach activities with our international student and our international graduate cohort. Um, we do monthly to bi month bi-weekly meetings on campus uh, with international students to explain how immigration works, what the pathways are, and what they need to do to be eligible to apply for them. Um, we do a number of social media announcements through our, through our social media pages uh, targeted towards our international students. Um, we faci facilitate presentations with our federal counterparts as well with regards to uh, immigration pathways that there may be perhaps uh, federal pathways that may be available to them as well as our provincial pathways. Um, in the last year, we've actually initiated a working group um, with our office. Uh, the three post-secondary institutions, Skills PEI, 
uh, international student advisors, and as well as our settlement agencies, such as the Immigrant and Refugee uh, uh, Services Association of PEI, as well as the French uh, settlement organization, La CIF. They all sit on the table so we can talk about issues and barriers that perhaps are, are facing international students and, and chat about how we can, how we can best address those. Um, we review international. We have our year-end international grad celebration event where we recognize our international graduates and again bring together service providers to be in the room to talk to international graduates about what settlement supports are available. Um, Skills PEI was there last year. Innovation PEI was la there last year, as well as a number of our settlement organizations. Um, and then obviously, as we do on a regular basis through all of our engagement, especially with our international graduates. We're constantly reviewing our immigration programs provincially um, and tr adjusting them if necessary to align with the needs of our international grads. I'm going to hand it over to Mary now and she's going to talk a little bit about workforce development and as well specific to the construction sector. Perfect. Thanks, Jeff. So you will see some uh, similarities in the sections that each of us present on, and it's really built on our engagement structures that we have. There are commonality in stakeholders that we engage and the role that we see government playing in developing key initiatives to support both immigration, workforce development, and population. So the slide that we have in front of you really talks about the six partners within the construction trades workforce development area that we would um, <clears throat> consistently engage. If you look at workforce development a number of years ago versus today, I hope you will see that our initiatives are based on innovative solutions and the ability to be able to pivot based on the scenario that's in front of us while focusing on developing skills for islanders to be successful and want to live and thrive in our province. So the, the six partners that we have that would, the six areas that we would have that we would be continuously engaging would be around, you know, both K-12 to system, uh, post-secondary in our province, our industry associations, our sectors, um, our employers and tradespeople to engage on where do we need to focus efforts in order to be successful in meeting the workforce requirements. Much like all sectors in PEI right now, the trade sector is one that's experiencing shortages and has a requirement for skilled investments in order to meet their growth plans moving forward. So I'm going to focus in on where we get supply information and what that looks like. So within the construction trades, we collaborate with Build Force Canada, which is a national organization who works with our post-secondary institutions, our statistics bureau, our workforce development agencies, industry between the Home Builders Association, the Construction Association, to look at what, <clears throat> what our existing workforce numbers are what um, predicted retirements will be over the forecast phase, and where we need to make um, investments on new entrants and skills development activity. So this last forecast would have been done April 2023, and I, and I want to talk about, you know, we use this as foundational information, but also a forecast is based on indicators at that time. And at that time, there certainly was a suggestion that there was going to be some rough water ahead with interest, interest rates and investments in, in the construction trade. So we had to take the information and look at where we were going to prioritize growth. Um, so the slide in front of you talks about that workforce, the supply side. The biggest challenge that we're facing in construction trades right now is the 22% of retirement figure over the forecast period leading up to 2032. Based on that, the data suggested that we really need to focus on the replacement data for that significant amount of retirement, growth into 23-24, and then potential a bit of a flat line of investments based on um, what the forecasting models were looking at at that time. We made the decision that our investment on new entrants would be significant, but we would also focus on expecting growth in the sector based on our housing direction that we were going in and the potential for retirements. 
I do want to flag, so the workforce numbers, the labour force numbers presented here on 2022, as you can see in the slide, would be direct construction trades um, at that 68.50. Our September 2022 numbers for construction did hit 8,200, which is an all-time high for our province, recognizing that we still have room to go, or we still have um, places to really focus on, and our retirement levels over the last couple of years were a little bit off. We were not seeing as many people that were eligible to retire, retire in the workforce. So how do we use that data from a planning perspective? So annually we do 10-year forecasts, and I think, you know, all of the partners are around the table talking about where do we invest. We, so in our Department of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population, we do have an advisory group through Apprenticeship and Trades who report through to our minister with representation from post-secondary um, institutions, industry and employers that provide guidance on our vision. So you can see our vision is to support growth and development and I want to break that out into growth we see as that new entrance of supply, development we see as investing in skills of islanders to succeed. In our department we define skilled trades the same as nationally defined skilled trades which means a completion of a Red Seal certification that demonstrates that you have the highest level of skills and skills and education to be able to successfully do the work within that field. So there's four key areas that we've been focused on in the last number of years. Career awareness, really trying to focus in on the influencers of how skilled trades can be a really uh, rewarding career path. Increasing participation and representation, whether it's through immigration with international recruitment or whether it's through initiatives that we're doing here in Prince Edward Island to support the um, increased representation of our equity deserving populations. The support high quality programming and improving completion rates is really around that skills development component of what we are doing for our investments to um, increase our completion rates around that skilled trades definition. And I do want to flag that all four of these areas are really based on engagement, collaboration, keeping consistent on what those investments are, but being aware that we have to be innovative in a changing world where something that we've done three or four years ago may need to be adjusted to meet the demands that we're facing today. So around career awareness, when my first slide presented who are the six areas that we collaborate on, we have been doing work with the K-12 system on youth apprenticeship and promoting skilled trades, encouraging students to look at opportunities that the trades present. We've been marketing skilled trades as a rewarding career path, and we've been um, promoting incentives to encourage trade participation. This happens in collaboration with our partners on the ground, primarily the Construction Association, the Home Builders um, PEI chapter of their association. But it also engages the federal government with respect to how do we encourage populations in Canada to see the opportunities that exist within skilled trades. So in September, you will see a national campaign that did launch that is called Follow Your Passion, Find Your Skilled Trades Pathway. And you can expect that we will be building on that national strategy here to use a PEI approach to really encourage that career awareness from an early age, but also focusing in on who influences career choice. It's, it's not just students. It can be parents, it can be educators, it can be community members on what the opportunities are. Increasing participation and representation is a um, key deliverable for our department. Equity deserving groups deserve more from government with respect to focusing in on ways that we can really support integration. So this past, um, for 20. 
2023-2024, our department has increased investments with um, the entry-level programs that focus on new entrants. So the Construction Association of Prince Edward Island with their Discover Carpentry, the <clears throat> Trade Horizons program with Women's Network, both of those in our budget that was passed for 23-24 led to doubling of the number of cohorts to really be able to expand that entry-level type of exposure programming to the trades. We also are a delivering entity with our federal partners on the Canadian Apprenticeship Service Grants for new entrants. When an employer hires a new entrant into the trade, they are eligible for a Canadian Service Agreement grant from the federal government and our department would administer those said grants. The element that um, the Office of Immigration is responsible for is the creation of the Occupations in Demand pathway where construction has been one of those career paths that has been identified through immigration as an opportunity for international recruitment. This has led to 46 employers in the construction trades utilizing immigration pathways. And I do want to flag that not all companies are ready for immigration pathways. There's work that is done with the sector on um, embracing opportunities around diversity and inclusion. The size of some companies may not lead to international recruitment, and that's the work that Jeff talked about earlier on getting out, engaging with companies to determine what the opportunities are and where they need to be if they're looking at international recruitment. Supporting high quality programming, we are very fortunate in the department that our education institutions have increased the investments that they've been making around the construction trades. So uh, Holland College recently in the media talked about they've doubled their classroom capacity around carpentry. Our apprenticeship numbers, we have more block release programs going now than what we have had around the construction trades. In particular, around carpentry, construction electricians, plumbing, those are programs that we really see as supporting the requirement around housing and where we need to focus in on some additional investments. The increase in those programming with the institutions or through apprenticeship is done in <coughs> consultation with industry on those pathways. And you will hear that, you know, industry does have some concerns about do we have capacity on the mentorship to be able to support that growth? Construction trades isn't different than any other sector that exists. You need to have the ability to offer that education pathway, but also support industry in being able to provide that guidance on shop floors so that they can mentor people to get to their full scope of trade. Improving completion rates has been a goal. We've talked about the duration of time that it takes to get to a Red Seal credential. This has been an issue across the country. I think we have the ability in PEI, sometimes small is good, where we can pull people together. So Red Seal completions on average are about 6,500 hours where you're working within the trades. There certainly has been some challenges with individuals going year after year, and, and, and we get that. The model has changed in apprenticeship where um, construction trades is full-time year-round work, and we are required to look at innovative models that don't look at a downtime in construction, because a downtime doesn't exist in construction anymore. So it's what additional supports do we need for the person who may have had a negative experience with school, or who is raising a family and can't afford to focus in on training. And that's where you'll see government's investment on earn and learn models that are referenced in our mandate letter, really focusing in on investments that address the barriers that um, trades workers could be feeling, and also focus in on earning and learning models that benefit the individual to improve our completion rates. The one element for this is, you know, that in engagement of, um, you know, talking about is it our goal to ensure that people reach full potential of their skill and their trade? And, you know, there's some tough discussions that happen about, 
You can invest in people and sometimes you lose people, which is a very real scenario that we get into discussing with industry and with the association. And, and I do think our department structure now allows us to focus in on people development which means we complement the economic development plans of the province, but our role is to help islanders to reach that full potential from a skills development and from an investment perspective. And that's what really pulls our divisions together to deliver our mandate. My final slide um, is really about the pathways. This, uh, I, when we were putting this slide together, I get it. It's, it's kind of bureaucratic about how we define the pathways. The messages that I wanted to provide was, it is never too early to start working towards a trade. We're starting early interventions in grade 9 and grade 10 around youth apprenticeship, where if they're working with an employer and that employer is providing the oversight, there are some introductory skills that they could be obtaining while in high school towards that completion of a Red Seal trade. So there's a direct entry with industry, and then there's a post-secondary pathway as well. Both at the end of the day will lead towards completion of block release to get to that highest level of certification. And we would have equal numbers that go direct entry with industry to go classroom environment. That is good news. I think the element where we need to focus is that awareness so that people know what those opportunities are. And you will see that, that additional investments that we make are focused in on those two pathways and then leveraging how we support other initiatives. For example, both direct entry and Holland College programs right now in Carpentry are building homes. They're focused in on tiny home development in collaboration with our housing division within the province. So it just speaks to the requirement of our collaboration and that broad impacts that our training can have to support other areas of need. I'm gonna kind of turn it over to Cal to speak to the population components, thank you. Thank you, Mary, and uh, thanks very much for having me today. I'm here to talk about the new population framework. Um, and obviously there's a lot of connection between what Jeff has talked about in terms of immigration being a key driver for population uh, for PEI. Obviously there are a number of other pathways, both in terms of interprovincial or, or uh, movement across Canada, uh, humanitarian pathways as well, uh, refugees, government assisted refugees, et cetera. Um, and then Mary talked about the workforce piece, and obviously all of these components uh, are heavily integrated, and we do work uh, very closely, our three divisions, with uh, the post-secondary uh, institutions, education uh, division as well. Population framework, how did we evolve to a framework? Uh, it was less than 10 years ago that our population was stagnant, and we've kind of taken almost a tr two transitions since then within the last eight or nine years. First, we went through an action plan that was developed, and that was really to um, spur on new growth, uh, which we did real start to realize in, in 2015, 2016. There was a new population action plan that was launched uh, 2017 and came to fruition 2022. So we saw that growth. What are we seeing now? And, and even since COVID, we've seen rapid growth and, and probably even another uptick in what we're witnessing uh, at, the, at the moment. With that brings a number of considerations. Um, and, and a framework is really being pulled together in a new framework is going to look at various considerations, but it's really all of us working together. It's, it's government, it, it's working across government, it's working with key stakeholders, community groups, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure that we have a keen focus on making sure that the supports, uh, the infrastructure um, services can keep pace and, and how can we make that happen um, in, in real time. So it's about a shared vision, and, and the new framework is really going to dive into that, really be used as a boilerplate on how the province needs to move forward. In terms of the population uh, framework, we did uh, go out to RFP um, and uh, bring in a consultant to help with this work, and, and one of the first tasks and main tasks is really to do comprehensive consultations. Um, and, and that was quite a robust process. There were various uh, virtual sessions across 
um, a number of uh, organizations, external organizations, whether that's sector councils, whether that's municipalities and, and the federation of municipality, on the education side, whether that's on the settlement side. Uh, so various organizations have been uh, fed into this uh, and provided feedback, industry, businesses, et cetera. Um, in addition to that, following virtual sessions, there were capstone or in-person sessions. Uh, the consultant came to PEI, um, and, and we looked at all the feedback and all the input. Um, and, and really, this, the consultations are being used to inform the new population framework um, and look at the various considerations that need to be um, um, considered as we move forward. An advisory committee uh, has been struck across the government, and it's an advisory committee on population to make sure that it, all departments are represented and all, all interests are represented across uh, government as well. And, and how, and obviously, there's a number of tentacles outside of government from that that has to take shape. In addition to that, uh, we did commission the Island Studies faculty at uh, University of PEI. Uh, which did have a, they ran a survey for us around for current and former residents, and that was really to get a better sense of why are people leaving PI, why, why are people staying on PI, and really looking at efforts to uh, focus in on retention and, and what are the, some of those main considerations that we have to take into account as well. In terms of the core considerations and, and, and or pressures that we need to continue to move forward, and a framework's really going to take shape around four or five key elements, and, and one being infrastructure and public services. Uh, obviously, we have to keep pace both from an infrastructure side, and that, that takes um, focus on a number of areas, whether it's housing, whether that's transportation, education, health, uh, early years, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot to consider here from an infrastructure perspective, um, and, and public services as well. They need to keep pace as well to make sure that government is keeping pace and what our public services look like as well. Um, in terms of workforce, and Mary's already alluded to this, the importance of workforce in, in a new population framework is going to be critical. And that's really focusing on the attraction piece um, and the upskilling and training pieces as well. What does that look like? And retention pieces are going to be important from a work, workforce perspective as well. Um, community uh, and sustainable communities and, and environment. Um, it was obviously a core theme, or it was a core theme that came through in terms of consultations as well. Uh, land use planning was something that uh, came, was loud and clear during consultations, and I would say in every session, uh, land use planning probably came up more than any other aspect. Obviously, there was housing, health, et cetera, but land use planning for PEI is something that we really need to advance and then start to improve on to, uh, for things to take shape. Uh, moving forward, uh, but it cannot come at the cost of environment changes, climate change as well, and there was loud and clear as well that this needed to uh, take shape and, and be uh, incorporated into any population framework moving forward. Then you have individuals that are coming to the province, and what does a sense of belonging, sense of place look like? Uh, obviously, the prop population much more diversified, um, and we need to make sure that we are taking concerted efforts um, in terms of making sure that people feel comfortable here, people feel welcome, and they have a sense of place and inclusion as we as we move forward. Finally, what kind of is the glue that binds all this, and it's really around planning and coordination. Um, government plays a key role in this. We're a leader in some areas, but we're not a leader in other areas. So it's really making sure that government uh, is focused in on the planning and coordination pieces, but we have to make sure that others play their role as well. So it's all of us uh, coming together to make sure that this can happen. Uh, population growth and then continued growth is real, and, and how do we, are we going to make sure that we can uh, tackle a number of these pressures and, and considerations moving forward. In parallel, uh, what we had done is go to RFP a few months after. Looking at, we figured around this planning and coordination piece, we had to take a bit more of a proactive approach. Uh, before the framework was was um, uh, pulled together and, and launched and, and look at a potential options for a planning tool to help with coordination. Um, it's really to help us inform potential investment decisions, uh, policy decisions moving forward, and that's in a number of areas that we've already discussed, whether that's housing, workforce, education, and a number of other areas, whether it could be services, et cetera. Um, the planning tool will help us to derive different growth scenarios. It will focus in on a refined population forecast. We have a number of data sources. We have a number of forecasting uh, tools, which are either through St Statistics Canada on the federal side, which has a number of, uh, they, they release population um, forecasting through 
uh, and have various growth scenarios. We also have uh, the Department of Finance and Economic Stats Bureau uh, within the province that um, also produces uh, population forecasting as well. But this planning tool is really to complement that and actually pull together a lot of the data sources that are out there. Um, it's not meant to be a linear model, but more of a it's a dynamic model where it's not just looking at housing and what does population growth mean moving forward. There's obviously a number of components within population itself, but the dynamic piece is what does it mean when population continues to grow and, and how is that correlated with other considerations, whether that's housing, what should the optimal mix of housing look like for PEI. Um, it could be on workforce pieces, what, what, what do we need from a workforce perspective. Um, education, do we need more schools and, and when, uh, the timing around that. So it's really about consolidating the data uh, and, and having another uh, source at our hands or tool at our, model at our hands to really help inform and guide decisions uh, of government but also external stakeholders as well. And finally, just to re recap, and, and Mary did provide a bit of an overview in terms of uh, the new Department of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population. We're heavily integrated in terms of the work that we do, uh, the, the four to five key divisions within our uh, department, but obviously that we just have a mandate responsibility for the workforce pieces, population pieces, uh, immigration, uh, post-secondary, et cetera. But there's also, also a number of other elements and, and considerations beyond our department, and that's either cross-government or external pieces. So just wanted to really focus in that it's going to be an integrated approach in how we move forward, and we've highlighted in the recap in terms of how our government really is. Uh, it's really about a Venn diagram, and there's going to be uh, interconnections and, and um, work working together that we need to do with other government departments, but also other uh, non-government groups, organizations, uh, associations, et cetera. Thanks very much for having us today. Thank you for coming and that very comprehensive uh, presentation. It is a, uh, uh, you know, a, there's a lot covered in that presentation and there's a lot that you're here to talk about. Um, I, I would remind the members that we did uh, want to talk about um, the construction sector in particular and then uh, also include uh, the importance of international students to post-secondary institutions. Those are kind of the focus. I think given the breadth of information, there's lots of questions you could ask, but maybe if we try and focus in on that, that's a good way to go. Um, also, I should point out that we do have an extra permanent member here now, so if someone does need to leave, we won't <laughs> lose quorum, so we're good to go. So uh, first on my list, I have uh, Gordon McNeely. Oh, thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. And thanks to the guests. Um, I, I know each, each one of you and how you've done um, good work in this field. Um, it's, it's been incredible the work that you've done. Where, where it falls down, I think, is that government isn't up to uh, maybe the same level of, of, in, of, of need for this. Um, today, like the, as the chair said, we're here to talk about some different things, but um, First one, we were updated on the population growth strategy, but I, I guess for the last year we've been asking for that document or that guiding figure. We don't have a housing strategy in PEI, and I'm just wondering where is the actual strategy? Um, is it? Uh, can you just speak to that? Sure. No, I appreciate the question. And in terms of, we've kind of have evolved from a strategy, and I know. Uh, Last year, uh, we were in here talking about the action plan and, and looking towards the population strategy. But as things evolve, the importance of moving, looking more as a framework and how we're going to work together from a planning coordination piece and collaborative piece. And you're going to hear those terms a lot today, but it's really making sure that we create the, that momentum in terms of uh, a framework. And it's really, as, as mentioned, going to be used as a boilerplate. Um, it's still under, uh, it's at final stages and, and uh, under development, but it, you have to appreciate as well the number of uh, areas, and we talked about an advisory committee that has been formed that every department is feeding into this, and you talk about a housing strategy. Um, there, there's a lot of other work um, ongoing through government, and we want to make sure that this framework is well aligned to a lot of those other strategies, initiatives um, that are that are uh, have been undertaken that are either current or, or future initiatives as well. So we want, need to make sure that the framework is both current but also forward-looking and then that's really how we're moving forward with the framework so um, definitely in the final stages and, and should be out 
soon. Uh, yeah, follow up by member. Yeah, and I mean, it's, I, I didn't know it was going to be a framework, action plan framework. It's one of the most crucial documents I think that we all need in Prince Edward Island, and it's uh, I know it's going to be done done right, and it's it because it, it's we have, we've made such changes. If you go back and look at our other action frameworks and stuff that were done in 2000, they don't they don't apply. This is this is new territory, and it's it it, it, it mixes between workforce diversity, uh, change. Uh, it, it's going in a new direction. Can you can you is that going to be a document from 2024? To, is it a, are we talking about a five year framework, or and and what is are, are we going to expect that? before the snow flies? We haven't really identified a specific date range for the framework because it's, it's a, as, as I mentioned before, it's a boilerplate, which is really going to be mentioning both current and, and long term. Now, we haven't really defined saying it should be a three-year or five-year plan. We know growth is here. Um, as we talked about, the growth continues and is evolving. We have so many considerations and requirements that are going to take uh, some will be a bit more short term in terms of trying to make uh, change, but others will, will be longer. There's with growth comes work, and I think that's uh, I don't think anyone can hide behind the fact that it's going to take a lot of work from a lot of people to make this happen. Um, in terms of, uh, I'm not sure when the first snowfall is going to be, but yes, hopefully before the snow, first yeah. snowfall, because I wouldn't assume it should be snowing here by by a November time frame. Helps, <laughs> okay, so. there we go. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to uh, Jamie, and then Rob, Peter, and then Susie. Jamie Fox. Thanks, Chair. Um, the topic hits so many different points of views, and one thing I noticed when, when COVID was going on and into it, you couldn't find a house in, in board in King Cora. There's the amount of people that came in from Ontario, Quebec, and bought these houses and moved in, because they saw it as a safe area in Prince Edward Island in general. So we saw that massive coming in. And what I've been seeing over the last number of years is our infrastructure. When I talk infrastructure, not only I'm talking about our roads, but our schools, our health care system, is not keeping up with where our population is going. And Somerset Elementary, prime example, back many years ago, Rob, you would remember this, and, and Peter would remember it, and Brad, um, when there was a talk about closing the schools. Mm -hmm. We've looked at Somerset School now, there are 40 some to 50 some students over capacity, and I can't get a temporary classroom put into the place. I can't look at getting something into the capital budget to do an improvement to that school for possibly for two years out. So then we look at our road systems. <laughs> Well, we've got more traffic on the roads, more transport trucks, and the roads were not designed for that population growth or the influx of vehicles that we're now traveling on the road. So you can look at everything and it's the same thing. So my question is, what needs to be done? How do we handle it? How do we get the people to, to build the houses or build the schools or work on the roads? or work on the farms. Like, we need the population, but we must make sure that our infrastructure is going parallel. And in my opinion, I don't think that's happening. So, I want to take a shot at Mary. Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll start and then I'll get Jeff and, and Cal to add in. I, I just, I want to build on the question that Mr. McNeely started with and, and you know, same level of need for this. I'm thinking he means government's role with respect to developing frameworks or, or what our position is on this. So really the framework and the rationale that our department went down this road, when you look at population growth and sustaining that growth with infrastructure, there's very broad spectrums to what we're talking about, from housing, infrastructure, workforce requirements, health needs, education. And I think once we started to unpackage that through our consultations, it's broader than what one department can do. This is all of government and all hands on deck in managing population growth strategically. The element for us is when you unpackage what is population growth and how is it, what is it derived from, births, deaths, international immigration, and domestic recruitment to the province. And I think the one element through the pandemic, we are a great place to raise a family, work, and live and that created a trend line with more people coming across Canada to pick PEI as home. 
good news story. What do we need to do to support the infrastructure? And that's really what the framework is tackling is all hands on deck, that population growth needs to continue to meet our workforce requirements, but it needs to be in collaboration so that we can lead forecasting on infrastructure requirements. The one piece for us is, this is very broad topics where government has a role to make sure the business, the environment is there for our stakeholders and others to succeed in a coordinated fashion. And our efforts are really going to be in the coordinated planning to be able to successfully manage that population growth. So, you know, that's kind of the, the rationale as to why we're going with the framework approach. And also recognize this is a world that's constantly changing. If you look at workforce and population over the past couple of years, you can see how often changes are happening to, you know, from schools, to infrastructure, so it, if we set the direction out too far, we're constantly having to pivot. A framework will keep us coordinated in our planning so that we can constantly address where we need to go and get buy-in that we're all in this to grow the population successfully. Jamie, do you have a follow-up? Oh, I'm fine. Okay. Uh, Rob Henderson. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, Mary, you, I know you're quite familiar with uh, Larry, the riding I represent. And uh, something that I'm sort of seeing is I still see an incredible amount of uh, exporting of our talent to other provinces. So uh, when I look at how many people from my constituency live in Prince Edward Island, live in O'Leary and Vernesse, but yet they're still working in other provinces. Do you track this or ha do you have an idea on how, what the number is on how many people and why they're, why they're still doing this if we have all these jobs and all these demands? Uh, and I, I can see it. I see it in trucking. I see it in construction. I see it in health care. I see it equipment operators, even farmers and fishers are working in other <coughs> provinces. How, how is this happening or why is this happening? So can you give me some enlightenment on what's going on in that fact? So great question and that is something that we are looking at. I, I think there's a couple of things. Um, individuals sometimes leave the province for the experience. So it's not necessarily that they're not aware of the opportunities that exist in PEI. They're looking for an opportunity to explore the world. And I think our position is we would never discourage that. We would make sure that it's a balanced approach so people see the opportunities that exist here. The positive for us is we see that leaving and returning home in the working age population becoming more predominant. When you look at construction trades, we do see, you know, we, we had many years where the pull to Western Canada was our number one concern around construction trades. That is not as predominant today as what it once was. There are people working, you know, choosing PEI to live and working abroad, they can be working anywhere in Canada and living and contributing in PEI. So it is something we measure. I do think when you look at the construction trades, some of that growth in 2023 in both earnings and in the workforce was from that middle age, working age population that were staying home because they were seeing the opportunities that exist in our province. So, so you're saying, up, well, just so you're saying it's wages, so we don't. We don't no, I, I wouldn't. So, I, mean, I, wouldn't. I find it hard to believe that a, a person who's uh, working in construction sees, sees the opportunity for massive travel when you're going out to Alberta to build houses. You're, you're just you're just in the construction site building houses. Or I would e even use the same argument as an equipment operator in a in a pit. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, that doesn't seem to make sense to me. So, uh, so are your stats? And then can you give me an idea of what the stats are? You're saying you're seeing a difference but how much of a difference is it? Because I'm not seeing much of a difference. <laughs> I think we can certainly break that down and provide you with some of the data. I'm not saying that everyone has chosen to stay in Prince Edward Island, and I do understand that there are some individuals who are feeling the need to leave the province to secure employment to support their family, and I don't want to diminish that. I think the piece for us is we're also seeing 
across the province where people are returning from provinces. They are, were benefiting, they've gained skills and experience um, from wherever they were working and living, and they're coming home creating companies and growing. And we see that, you know, I, I can think of one of the associations that we collaborate with where he was in Alberta for a number of years and made the decision to return to the province to take those skills and build out his company here. So yes, it is something that we track and we monitor, but do I think we are starting to see that um, catch up of compensation and the ability to be able to make a living and live in PEI? Yes, I am. Peter Van Baker. Thank you, Chair. I really appreciate you all being here today. Um, but I must say, I'm, I found the presentation deeply upsetting and disconcerting, and I'll tell you why. Not because of you. It's because back in uh, June, when I asked the minister uh, some questions about the population strategy, I was told in response that we were, and I quote, putting final touches on it. That was in June. Here we are four months later, and I hear from you all that I, I, I hear no sense of a plan here, no sense of a strategy that we're collecting data, and as you put it, Cal, growth is here. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the quote right. Uh, yeah, but, but I don't hear any semblance of a plan as to what Prince Edward Island is going to do to accommodate this unprecedented, and that's, that's an appropriate word to use. So is there a plan? Yeah, so the plan is just around the corner. It's, <laughs> it's I, I think when you talk about data, I think we're well past that stage in terms of the consultations and the feedback they received. It's just final touches on, on the framework. So that's what a framework is. It, it's a plan of to move forward. So bringing all those departments together and, and what does that look like from both we're, – we're identifying what are those current and, and uh, future initiatives, what they need need to look like as well. So that, that's what the plan will encompass is, is exactly what you're talking about. Um, trying to understand the data side, we're well past that stage in terms of consultations and feedback and gathering information uh, moving forward. So, Peter, follow up? Yeah, thanks, Chair. So one of the things that we've heard is that the, the goal is, is for the population of PEI to reach 200,000 by 2030, seven years away. Um, we know how hard we're struggling currently to provide services for the population that exists on PEI today. And you mentioned healthcare and education and housing and infrastructure anywhere basically is, is really struggling. So I, um, I'm, the, the really concerning thing for me is that we're not keeping our heads above water today. And government, I think, needs to, and again, this is not, you, you're not the decision makers, you're wonderful civil servants doing a great job in the various areas you're doing, but we need a government that recognizes that there are challenges with the rate of growth that we've had over the last few years. We need services for people, but we also need people to provide those services, and it's a real conundrum. And I would really love to know, and I, Cal, you're saying it, it's coming and maybe before the snow flies, assuming things are okay climate-wise, um, but I would love to know um, what the immediate goal is in terms of, let, let's pick one of these sectors, just as an example, construction, which is one of the areas, Chair, that we agreed that we would talk about yep. today. In the last year, we had 4.6% growth, 7,000 new people on Prince Edward Island. If we take the average family of 2.3, that's 3,000 new homes that we have to build. I see on the, the projected growth in the construction sector, it's less than 2%. Over 10 years that you have, um, I, I think I'm right, I, if my math is correct on that, almost essentially the same number of workers in 10 years as we have today. We're not even close to keeping up with the requirement of today. So what is government's plan to ensure that there is adequate housing, a basic human right, not only for all the islanders who are here today, but for this projected unprecedented growth over the next three, five, take, take your pick, seven years? 
Great question. Um, thank you. I think I'll start on that one and then certainly Cal, Jeff, jump in. So I, I do want to talk about our department's approach on population piece and why framework versus setting strategic direction um, based on your, your inquiry. And I, I think the element for us is we are not suggesting that work is not happening where we are engaged with housing, for example, or we are engaged with land use, or we are engaged in workforce. So I, I think setting the direction of population growth and ensuring the infrastructure is in place to support that growth is the mandate of the province. How that's happening, I think, you know, you're seeing Cal talk about the release of the framework, but I want to talk about all of those areas that he talked about. There's also work being led by the required department and list of stakeholders around that said topic to build out that growth. We all want to have that sustained population growth and infrastructure invested investments matching. I think, you know, with the data that you're suggesting, the 2.3 family size and the number of housing required, really you need to dig into population growth and what that looks like. Where's our population growth coming from? Are we seeing growth, whether it be from international students who are uh, transitioning to permanent residency as part of population growth? Is it young families? Is it seniors? So the makeup of what is required is um, really determined based on the immigration, the population piece, and who we're attracting to PEI. Yes, I do, and, and through the slides, we talked about the need that we need to grow the workforce sector, but we also need to grow in an area where we can meet what the demands are, but we also are doing that in a balanced approach. So we're seeing some labor market efficiencies within the construction sector. We know growth has to happen on both new entrants, skills development, and you know hitting that target to be able to build and sustain. But we also have to be aware of some of the constraints that happening, happen around the economy and, and some challenges that that could, that could present. So I, I think growth, balanced and being responsive to industry needs and also using our forecast as a foundation um, to meet those infrastructure requirements are the goals. So, you know, it is, it's a challenge for us. I think in my career, never has workforce been spread through every sector that exists in this province. And it's something that we are very <coughs> conscientious about what government's role should be in supporting industry, employers, and individuals to meet that full um, scope within their abilities. I hope that helps. Uh, I can add you back on the list, please. Please, sure. Okay. Uh, Susie, Dylan? I was wondering if you might be able to give me a little bit of more information on, on what you do to support um, families that come to make Prince Art Island their home, and then they have children that want to go on to do post-secondary education. And my understanding is that, um, I guess it would depend on how long you lived here, on how you are able to access the supports that other islanders get. That makes so I, I just I want to make sure that we understand the question. So yeah. are you asking if you are a temporary resident in PEI where you come through an immigration pathway what supports are your children given for post-secondary education as a temporary resident? So is it a temporary, I guess that would be my question, is it at what point do you become um, a student on, in our province that's able to access the level of funding? So, okay, so I, I just to understand yeah, yeah. Your, your question, yeah, yeah. and if I'm Sorry, wrong, do a very good job. if I'm going, if I'm going down the wrong path, let me know, but yeah, as Mary said, when, when somebody comes here as a temporary resident, say on a work permit, for example, um, their children are entitled to, to attend K-12 to school free of charge um, here in the province. Once it gets to post-secondary educations, if the family is here on a temporary basis, they have to pay the international student fees. Those are policies that are set out by the post-secondary institutions, and that's fairly consistent across the country, not just here in PEI. Once they get their permanent residence, then they're entitled to pay domestic student rates at that point in time. I think that's your question. That is my question. Thank you. Susie, have a follow-up on that? Nope. It's good, okay. thanks. Thank you. Um, 
so I just wanted to ask a question too as we go through the, the rotation here. Um, Robin, you didn't have anything you wanted to add? No. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that uh, during the last election knocking on doors, a lot of people said, you know, if we're having such pressure on our infrastructure and public services right now, why don't we slow population growth until we catch up? I mean, it seems, seems obvious. And, and whether or not that's advisable is one thing, but my first question is, um, how much control do we actually have on our population growth? I mean, there's, there's different areas that you outline, whether it be through immigration or domestic, uh, I guess, movement. Um, so how much control do we have on our population growth? How much is within our control and how much is outside our control? Well, maybe I'll start that and maybe Jeff yeah. can we'll kind of take this as a two-pronged approach uh, from an international perspective. From a domestic perspective and interprovincial migration, obviously, once someone's resident in Canada, they're, they're free to move anywhere. So the uptick that we've been seeing, um, and, and you look at over the past year, I think it was 15 to 1,600 individuals net positive coming to PEI versus out migration. Quite significant, and I think Mary touched on a lot of that in terms of PEI being witnessed and seen as a great place to live, uh, raise a family, and all of these are attributing to population growth. So from that perspective, um, organically we're going to have increase at, at this point. Whether that is maintained or sustained, that's something to be seen. Uh, we'll have to continue to see what that, how that evolves over time, uh, given some of the other considerations that, that PEI is facing. Um, from a humanitarian perspective, obviously we're also seeing other pathways, both through um, government-assisted refugees, uh, those seeking refuge, whether it's the Ukraine initiative. So those are situations I think the province wants to definitely support those humanitarian uh, right. pathways as well in terms of, and, and support those individuals that are fleeing from very difficult situations. So th those are two pathways that I will discuss, um, but in terms of maybe on the international side, Jeff will talk about the international growth that we're witnessing, Thanks, which is the key driver uh, accounting for a large percentage of the population growth right. as well. Yeah. yeah, so on an annual basis, each province speaking towards the, the provincial nominee program and the Atlantic Immigration Program, which are the programs that we administer here in PEI, our office, each province is given an allocation on an annual basis by the federal government of Canada. So for 2023, our annual allocation was approximately 2,050 family units. So that's the family unit. So um, that would equate to approximately 3,000 to 3,200 individuals when you include the, the family. So those are individuals that come here and would qualify for our programs that we would nominate for permanent residency. So, so there is kind of a cap on that side of things. The real wild card, and Cal alluded to it, is if somebody is in Canada on a temporary basis with an open work permit, say a postgraduate work permit, um, a spousal work permit with someone else, they're free to travel within Canada and gain employment anywhere. Um, and those are the ones that we have a harder time tracking because you really don't know when somebody's crossing the bridge to come to PEI. So, so that's a little bit harder one to kind of track and keep track of. But with regards to our nominations and our programs, we're kind of capped at that 2050 for this year family units that we can process for permanent residents. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to move uh, back to Gord McNeely now. Yeah, well, thank you, Chair. And uh, yeah, this is a great, this is a great um, conversation. A lot of it has to do with like people that I talk to on a regular basis, seeing things on the ground. And 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 you mentioned in your presentation, and I, I just I, I didn't understand it. You said not all companies are ready for diversity. Um, what what does that what does that mean? What do you? So I think that was me, mm -hmm. and the. The position, not all companies are ready for immigration, um, was the comment. And I think the element of whether it's Jeff's shop or if it's our division in workforce that we would assess is, is a, how, it, does a company have an HR plan? We're not suggesting they need HR resources, but are they looking at what their current needs are? Do they have job descriptions? 
do they have compensation uh, package that's reflective of the sector and the needs? Do they have a plan in place on ensuring integration? Have they participated previously in diversity, inclusion, equity type of training? Is this a, an idea that they've thought through and are they willing as a company to engage with the community in order to make successful onboarding and integration into their company and that is an assessment that both divisions would be doing. There has been times where we would say we think immigration is probably makes sense for you after the following takes place and we would be making sure that that experience is going to be positive for their growth plan. And, and this is where the I, I, I would agree with that for different companies, but this is where the incentive comes in and where government comes in. If they're serious about this, if they want to build more housing, and if you think it's we can do this through immigration and diversity, that's where the incentives come in through government. And this is where the presentation is weak. There's no clear incentives for companies to hire people that can, I mean, skills PI is there, but, but we, we exclude PR people from that from that stream, if, if correct me if I'm wrong, or, or in various aspects of it, no. Uh, but so, Barry, did you want to answer that? Are our incentives enough for companies to hire diverse members of our community so that we can build more housing? If that's our avenue for our success. So uh, you're right. Our presentation really didn't focus on investments and and where we are investing because we were trying to figure out how to come in and present information from the planning perspective. Uh, I, you know, let's talk about that. We did cover a slide on um, Office of Immigration and International Recruitment. We talked about international students. Our goal collectively as a department is to make that integration period from if they arrive as a student to gain work experience to stay in the province and go through permanent resident pathways. So, you know, investments that we're making would be from study and stay with Cal's Division of Population Settlement Partner with ACOA. We, on our graduate mentorship program for companies, have created a provincial budget line for temporary residents because our federal um, agreements restrict your right to permanent residents and Canadian citizens. So we have now joined with, um, you know, identifying pathways for international students to be able to stay and remain in the province. And that's the number one recommendation from all studies that happen on on how do you best integrate international students into the population. You attach early with opportunities of sense of belonging through settlement and through workforce. And both divisions are investing um, to meet that goal. Um, could we do more? Yes, we can, and I think that's the piece of trying to get out with our engagement partners to see if there's more opportunities for growth. I spoke about um, the Canadian Apprenticeship Service grant agreement um, with the federal government that focuses on underrepresented population. Um, there's no restrictions in play for international student temporary residents around that. Um, and there's additional incentives if individuals are from equity deserving groups where the percentage of overall workforce numbers are lower. So I think, you know, we could, we could certainly provide the list of incentives and how those get adjusted to meet the, the collaboration that we're doing with the sectors of identifying gaps and strategically moving to address those gaps. All right. Thank you. Peter Baker. Thanks, Chair. Um, Mary, you started out, and I think it was right at the very beginning, and you, you talked about developing a talent pipeline and people's sense of developing a sense of belonging, and I agree that's absolutely critical for both for personal well-being, but also for the, for the province as a whole. Um, I know traditionally and historically our retention numbers are not up to snuff compared to, the, uh, to other provinces. Are you keeping track of that and where are our retention numbers now? So a couple of 
things, and I'll, I'll get Jeff to jump in on some of the retention data. I think, you know, when you're looking at the Statistics Canada retention data, I know they just released 2015, 16? It was 2021 data, so the five year would be 2016. Yeah. So the data that was just released was for the period of time looking at 2015, 2016. And I think the piece for us that we're tracking is, you know, we're looking at international students, we're looking at families that we recruit, 95% of Jeff's nominations are happening to support workforce development. We're seeing those individuals come through apprenticeship pathways. We're seeing more international students make the decision to stay in our province. So we certainly are seeing where our investments are leading to stronger retention. At present across Canada, there is no measurement of that short-term retention levels, but I think when you look at all of the pressures we're having in infrastructure is based on some of that success and desire that people are having to stay. International students tell us if sense of belonging and employment is addressed early on in that student placement at post-secondary, they will have a stronger desire to stay, and that's where we're putting our investments. Peter, follow up? Yeah, please, Chair. Thanks. Um, you know, having spoken to many New Islanders uh, who, are, who are here um, and have not yet gained their citizenship, Canadian citizenship, but uh, many of them view Prince Edward Island as a sort of a, a place they're moving through. Uh, they may have, uh, and this is anecdotal, I absolutely admit that, but it's a recurring conversation that I, I have had whether they're folks working in the service industry, folks working for telecommunications companies, first with folks working in construction trades. It's a similar conversation that I have repeatedly. And it's, yeah, I'm here on PEI, but their version of, I can't wait to get away and go to Ontario or BC or somewhere else, which is a concerning thing. So I'm wondering, uh, and I know, Mary, you're saying that you feel that our retention numbers are improving. Um, because it's, a really, it's going to be a big issue for us if our higher population here are not people who are actually permanently living in our community, but it's just a higher population of people transient on their way through PEI to somewhere, somewhere else. Those bring very different dynamics to, the, to Prince Edward Island. So when could we, and you say that 2015 is the most recent data that we can get from the federal government, but is, are you keeping track of anything provincially that would give us more up-to-date and perhaps more accurate figures on that? So I'll, I'll turn the latter part of that question over to, to Jeff, but I, I think the, the element for us is uh, we too hear conversations that happen in the community about, um, you know, PEI may not be the place long term that I'm looking at. And I, I think there's recognition that's happened in Canada that when you're recruiting abroad, sometimes there are, there, there's a natural trend line to big cities in Canada. Yeah. And that's why programs like the Atlantic Immigration Pilot have been born, Occupations in Demand have been born, where we are strategically trying to recruit based on our size, our um, opportunity that exists in the province, and connection into workforce. That's why we're strategically trying to attach to international students who have chosen PEI through recruitment of post-secondary institutions to attach to. We do, much like our domestic population, we have families that unfortunately arrive in our province that feel they need a bigger population in order to be able to, to integrate into Canada. And, and we feel that more in a small jurisdiction than a big jurisdiction where you could move city to city of populations of over a million people. So, you know, I, I think we are very aware of that and that's why the strategy has been connect in with individuals who are choosing to come to the province for that workforce connectivity through international students and build on that talent development piece. As far as data that we collect, I think our population data we're always looking at. I think the one element, and, and you had referenced about population growth numbers and a requirement for, I think you said 3,000 new homes. We're looking at the data, looking at, okay, how many people have 
have been here as temporary residents where they've already identified a home, their children may be in school, and they're now applying for permanent residency, which brings them to a permanent resident, but they're already established in PEI does need to be taken into consideration when you're looking at that projected infrastructure need. Um, as far as data, I know, you know, our partners are collecting through, you know, for us on workforce, the new uh, immig Immigrant Refugee Services Agency of PEI. Um, we would work with them on whoever they serve, international students being one, where we would track a year post um, program development. So if, if they go to work with ABC Company, a year later we're, we're following up to see are they still with ABC Company. So we would have individual initiative data. Um, as far as overall retention data. Yeah, the, the official number is that StatsCan data that comes out every year. And unfortunately, it is somewhat dated because of it's, there is a lag there. And, and, you know, in some cases, it's measuring programs that don't even exist anymore. So that's that's the challenge there. Um, Cal, maybe you can speak a little bit to what you guys yeah, have done. But we've, we've tried doing some surveying in the past, and, mm -hmm. and it just it has we haven't got enough responses to really ha get an accurate number just because, you know, the the tax filer data is based on somebody filing a federal tax return, so they have to do that. If we reach out five years after somebody gets their PR through our office, they have no obligation to respond to us. Um, so, so we found that the responses were sometimes, again, the, the volume of responses wasn't enough to get an accurate sample to, to really report on that. But to, to speak to kind of the, some of the activities with regards to retention, it, it is top of mind. Um, we have that discussion. It goes back to what Mary said. We were talking about companies and if they're ready for immigration. You know, when we're talking to companies, we always talk about, you know, if you want to retain an employee, you've got to make sure that you have, you know, a fair benefits package. You know, you have to make sure that they're, they're treated well in, in your environment. You have a safe workplace, that they're welcomed. And, uh, and as an employer, you're providing those, you know, those supports to, to, to really do that. Um, so we do have those co uh, those conversations with employers on a regular basis. Cal, did you want to kind of talk about anything you guys are yeah, doing? Yeah, and I guess from more from a retention perspective, but from our perspective, it really is providing those supports and, and working with our partners to make sure that uh, those considerations are in play. And it's working with our settlement organizations. Uh, we've we've launched a this is the second year, I guess, that we have a gender equity, diversity, inclusion, community enhancement program, which will exceed $600,000 this year and well oversubscribed in terms of um, bringing community groups together and, and a number of tremendous proposals. And it's really around that sense of belonging, sense of place, having uh, communities, uh, they can celebrate events, do a number of things. So it's a very broad criteria. So that's one example of some of the supports we put in place. In addition to that, uh, you talk about sense of belonging and some of the needs out there. We are continuing to expand uh, funding for partners and have continued, uh, whether that's in rural PEI in terms of community navigators, um, but also just other groups that have come to the forefront through uh, BIPOC Usher, Black Culture Society, um, so on and so forth, PI Connectors, if we continue to, there's joint funding through our department uh, for, for that program as well. Uh, Mary alluded to uh, study and stay. Um, major uptick is going to be the highest number of um, uh, students going through that program this year. So, <coughs> 120 plus students going through that program this year. So, that's really advanced over the past number of two or three years. So, really is around that sense of belonging and, and continue to looking at su supports and additional expanded supports that will be coming out for other community groups as well. Uh, I'll, I'll add you back on the list, Peter. I appreciate your patience. Thank you. uh, Jamie Fox. Sure. Uh, we're covering a lot of territory here today, and, and I appreciate your answers. And the honorable members are, are bringing up some really good points, which is leading me down another path. I don't understand something, and it, it's we we need the population, so we bring in workers from other countries, and they get they, they get sponsored by a business, and they work in our communities, which is fine because our businesses need them. A business files for bankruptcy. Mr. Henderson might know the business. Very large business employed a vast number of people. I've got farmers coming to me and saying that some of these workers who are in the country now have no place to work because that business is closed because they filed for bankruptcy. 
how come I can't hire them to work on the farm? So I find out there's what they call an open and closed system. If it's an open ticket, then they can work from business to business. But if it's a closed ticket, no, no, it's better to let them people sit home and not do anything and not be able to provide for their families and not be able to, you know, keep their kids in activities, whatever, which is putting a burden on our food banks. So the South Shore Food Bank has told me that their food banks, their meals that they're putting out is now actually substantially increased because these families aren't working. Why is this allowed to happen? Why can't these people that want to work be allowed to go to the businesses and actually work instead of being said, nope, you have to sit home and fend for yourself? So I'll uh, start that response and then Jeff, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. So first of all, I want to talk about when a company in our province does uh, go through challenges, we do offer transitional services right away. So companies that have announced a closure, my team's goal is to connect everyone to the workforce as quick as possible, recognizing that we would have a mix of temporary residents and permanent residents there. In giving, uh, so you asked about open and closed work permits and you asked about agriculture and different sectors. There are different pathways that exist in our province. So if the individual is here on a labor um, market impact assessment um, called by some LMIA, LMIAs, I, there's a number of, of different terms that employers use. That individual is on a closed, restricted to work for said employer. Since the pandemic, the federal government has worked um, very hard to enable that individual. They agree that the person needs to be connected to the workforce as quick as possible and does have processes in place where the individual worker can apply to have an open work permit to allow them to integrate quickly. So I, I do want to let you know that we're working very closely with companies that do have these transitions to try our best to connect them as quick as possible. There's also, so there's, there's closed work permits, there's open work permits where they could be here in the province as a spouse or other conditions which will allow us to make those connections quickly. A closed work permit, you are correct they have to apply and have their work permit changed before they can integrate into the workforce. We're monitoring those scenarios and try as quick as possible to make that transition, but that is federal requirements on changing the work permit from a closed to an open to allow them to work. Yeah, so as Mary said, those are federal requirements. Now, provincially, we do have some mechanisms to assist people in these situations, and, and we are actually planning a session for these individuals that you mentioned that have been impacted by this company. Mm -hmm. So so we're going to have a session for them to kind of explain what options are open to them. Um, to access our provincial programs, they do need to have permanent full-time employment. We can't, uh, we can't assist with the seasonal aspect of that, and that's just... That's in our agreements with the federal government that I that I alluded to kind of in my part of the presentation. But, you know, if we can facilitate a transition to a, a, a full-time year-round position with another employer, we do have the ability to help them flip that work permit over to okay. a new employer. So, so that is in process for that specific uh, case. And we have done that in the mm -hmm. past with other situations okay. where, you know, there have been massive layoffs or a company has, has gone into protection of some sort. So... We do have some 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 ways to assist. Um, just it's a little bulkier. And yeah. maybe just to add to that, because I think you mentioned a couple of different sectors. When we're doing that assessment, if the individual was on a pathway to stay in the province permanently and apply for permanent residency, then we're looking for a match in that employment type. So we would be we would be not looking at seasonal opportunities that don't allow that pathway to continue for permanent residency. Um, so there's a bit of a balance that we do where you may hear that we're working with the individual and that permanent position is deemed as the priority. It's because of that keeping the permanent resident application open. Uh, follow up. Yeah, just just so so these farm companies, should I be telling them to contact or ask them to contact your office or what? Like? 
So what I can tell you is I think between the two divisions, we would be very active um, okay. with, you know, the job search fees. The one element that um, my team would frequently tell employers is, first of all, you have to be running ads of what the opportunities are, because okay. I know we hear from some employers and I'm going back on their job vacancy data to see if they've got active um, ads running on opportunities, and if they don't, then we won't be looking at immigration necessarily right away because we have a requirement to ensure that they're meeting domestic um, labor demands as a first priority. So yes, you can have them call. We've got offices across the province, so depending where they are, they can connect in with, with our office to have that discussion. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right, uh, Rob. Just a quick follow-up what Jamie had asked there. So, so for the temporary foreign worker, that's effective, and we all know the company, but they, they reach out to the skills PEI office or to the department, I guess is what I'm trying to So in this specific case, okay. like I said, we are planning uh, a session for these individuals, yeah. and we our office will be reaching out to them to them or their the employer for them to get that information out right. to them. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now just to okay, follow yes, up. Rob, with, yes. Yeah, to follow up my question. I actually want to uh, link on a little more to what uh, Jamie had said in his first question, but... So we're projecting 200,000 of a population. Your department is projecting that uh, by 2030. So that's actually six years away, really, six years and two months. So it's, <laughs> so it's really coming. And I, and I do have some really big concerns about our infrastructure to be able to handle that in such a short window of time. So your department really makes the predictions that this is coming. You're, 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 it's, a, it's based on informed information that you're providing. And it's providing that information to all the other departments, I'm assuming, out there. But is there any impetus on those departments to actually fulfill what you're recommending? And do you, do you tell those departments that there's a breaking point here? If, if we, we're, I think we're seeing it in housing. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I can talk about, we can say roads. I mean, actually, why I'm a bit late, I decided to come in University Avenue. Holy jumping, what a traffic jam <laughs> coming in through there. Yes. Uh, and when we look at uh, child care, is another issue that we're massive struggles there, health care, uh, even just the workforce, the education. And I'm really more concerned about our electrical system, our electrical grid system. So do you make recommendations that our system can't handle 200,000 people by 2030 at this point? Or, or what's, what role do you play as a department? Are you just a number cruncher and sort of pass that out to the government and say, here's what you got to do? Or do you have anything on there to say, you have to meet this, and if you don't meet it, this is what the problem's going to be? Yeah, just, well, maybe just to start, and if Mayor Jeff want to weigh in, but I'd say that the 200 thousand figure you're talking about isn't necessarily being directed out of our shop or our oh. department it's those are numbers that we've talked to Department of Finance about and that that's a um, forecast based on um, obviously births deaths uh, interprovincial uh, international etc and it's we, we talk to them and we we are developing a planning tool as we talked about where it's in the evaluation stages right now in terms of developing what does a baseline tool look like and we're, we're doing that assessment to help guide um, and we'll see where that model leads us to help guide some potential decision making uh, and potential questions that other departments might have so for us we're not going in there saying we're directing you this is definitely where the population is going it's it's definitely a collaborative approach in terms of where uh, we feel right now the forecast is landing are there challenges in terms of infrastructure needs exact uh, absolutely but I think the evaluation of our planning tool should help at least provide some guidance in that space in terms of where what investments and what priorities should the government be uh, making um, now and, and in the short term medium long term is kind of how I would uh, depict that um, but it is a collaborative effort so I wouldn't just su suggest that our department is here you go this is what what the population is everyone off go off and do their own thing that's why we're talking about that collaborative integrated approach from that perspective so I don't know yeah, maybe just to add to that, I don't think I've ever been called a number cruncher before in our department because that's certainly not my strength. We leave that to the economists and, and some of the other analysts that we have that support us. Uh, I know you do. I know you do. I, I think the piece for us, and, and you talk about, you know, the 200,000, as Cal referenced, that's considered moderate growth for us based on those projections. If And I, I know, you know, the health recruiters were in here today, 
So when we're looking at the levers that we have on population growth, we can't afford to say that we're not going to continue to use immigration to grow our population. And that's the lever that we have, because there are so many pressures in workforce. You talk about health as, as an example of where, you know, your reference of a breaking point. I'd kind of make that counter argument about we live in an aging population where all of us are only having so big of family sizes and we can't sustain the growth required for us to be a destination of choice and support those infrastructure needs. So it is, I think, the element for us is we are engaged um, collaboratively with government departments as well as with communities um, and sectors to talk about how can we do this so that the infrastructures are in place and there's an awareness of that 200,000 and, and where we're going and the demands that we're feeling from workforce and other components of that growth to support. Um, you know, we now, the other element to this that we didn't kind of unpackage is we have small communities now that are thriving from population groups where they were really nervous about what their futures were. And when we talk to them, and ask them why are they growing, they will say, well, it's because of immigration and that connectivity through the workforce and that sense of belonging. So it, it, it's creating an awareness, it's being collaborative on our planning and recognizing that growth is going to be required in order to really get us out of some of those infrastructure and challenges that we have in sectors such as health to be able to meet those needs. I have to follow up on that. Though. Okay, I'll give you one more. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, so I mean, the, what, but here's what I sort of see. So, if we're saying now 200,000 is moderate prediction of growth by 2030, six years away, now there's the immediate impact of that's 200,000 taxpayers, or the bulk of them will be taxpayers. That's a good thing. But, but we also have to have the supporting infrastructure that backs that, and that means that's a, an issue when it comes to governments having to meet and fulfill the obligations. So when we say we have an aging population, that is correct, and uh, as a former Minister of Health, you know, we're in a situation, it's the beds, we need the infrastructure to have the beds for them, but we also need the staffing <laughs> to, to provide that care. I mean, currently there's probably a number, probably 50 to 100 beds sitting empty long-term care in Prince Edward Island. Don't have the staff to fulfill that. Yeah. So, so, so there's, a, there's major equations. So government is taking the, the strategy, it's, it's a great bonus to have 200,000 taxpayers, but now there's the obligation on government to make sure they're fulfilling the obligations providing the services to what we normally get accustomed to, and we're already seeing, so that's why I go back to, do we have the electrical capacity to do that? Do we, do we have the childcare? Do we have the workforce for, for construction? The schools, um, Jamie Foxx mentioned his school is over capacity. So, so I'm just saying, so that comes as, a, as a, a, an issue for tax governments for the, to pay those services. So I, I just really think that there needs to be, it's great to have the statistics and it's great to have where we're kind of going with the plan on this, but there has to be an impetus on government to make sure they're fulfilling these obligations. Now, I know that's a political question, and I guess if they do a good job of it, they'll be, they'll be successful. If they don't, Somebody else has a crack at it. But I, I just wonder where you need to go to try to sort of say, what, what's the warnings? And it sounds like 200,000 might be moderate. So we could be 220, 220,000 in six years' time. Wow, that's... So I think your, your commentary is very supportive of the framework plan that we've talked about today because this is not just an all of government approach, this is an all of PEI mm -hmm. approach where there is that ability to look at what the forecast is and work collaboratively to ensure that we do invest in the appropriate areas required. I don't have a background in childcare for example, but I can tell you the ADM of childcare and the Early Childhood Development Association works very closely with our team on looking at what those requirements are. And I can tell you that every sector that we work with is embracing diversity, integration, and inclusion and trying to figure out ways to make that pathway as seamless as possible. We have not heard from anyone that I know I've consulted with that 
has concerns with immigration. I think there are concerns with investing in infrastructure. And the best way for us to ensure that we know what is happening is that model of a framework where housing, educators, others with that expertise can look at the population kind of growth projections and ensure that investments are happening that support that land growth. So, you know, I think that's kind of why we did take a different approach this time around versus, you know, yes, looking at a number as one element, but that coordinated requirement is extremely important to help us position the province um, with the investments that are required, and it is going to take an all of PEI approach to that, um, one that is uh, requires that additional element in addition to government. I'm going to go to Peter Bebb Baker. Thank you. I mean, that's a perfect segue for my the next question, actually, Mary, because I, 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 this is such a complex issue, and population has an impact across every aspect of our island. And you, you said it's not um, not just a whole of government problem, it's a whole of PEI. I'm not problem. It's a I can't look at it as necessarily a problem, but it's a challenge and yep. an opportunity. Um, and I'm just going to read something from a CBC report from just uh, July 12th, actually. And it was uh, Minister Lance was meeting with the federal housing minister to talk about the rapid housing initiative, and they were talking about the future of housing on Prince Edward Island. So I'll just read a very small portion of the report. While the aim of the new housing policy will be to accommodate a population growing at historic rates, Lance said as Housing Minister he is not directly involved in formulating the population strategy, which is also expected later this summer. Population Minister Jen Redmond is responsible for the population strategy, said Lance, and he goes on. I've had a small briefing on, generally, our population strategy here in the province, but no, that's not a part of anything my department is involved with. Whoa. I mean, that's why my first comments about feeling disquieted by this um, are there, because I'm hearing a minister just a couple of months ago saying that, no, it's not anything his department is involved with, and we're hearing yet that this is a, an all of government. So which is it? <laughs> and again, I want to be clear that my concern is with government here. It's not with the job that you're doing. Let me be absolutely clear on that. So, you know, I think from the perspective of looking at the timing of that interview, I, I would need to look at more July of the 12. comments. Um, you know, from a bureaucracy component, I think, you know, we can each speak to the amount of time that we're spending on cross-collaboration with with uh, divisions and departments. And, and I can tell you in the last three years, it has been a significant investment that we've made. Um, you know... Certainly, uh, when new ministers are coming into government, there's a lot of learning that happens. And, um, you know, uh, I think even in my own shop, uh, it is our responsibility to ensure the minister is aware of all of those pieces. And based on the timeline of when that interview happened, uh, maybe the briefings hadn't occurred. But as far as population framework, some of the other development work that's been taking place, um, I would suggest we are entrenched in uh, cross-collaboration around housing, infrastructure, education, health workforce, planning. Um, I think I could continue on justice. So um, I, I, that's our position on that. Yeah. No, just, just to maybe yeah. reiterate and reaffirm, um, obviously we do have the advisory committee on population across, and every department has uh, represented on that committee, but there, there's also other uh, groups that we're heavily involved with as well, to Mary's point, um, obviously from a housing perspective, from a land use perspective. So um, in my 15 years in government, I'd say it's probably the most collaborative I've seen in terms of having to move forward uh, together, and, and that's, that's been because of the evolution that we've seen over the past decade plus um, and how things have evolved so rapidly. So I think it's it is an integrated, and I know we're using that word a lot, but it is an integrated approach, and it's it's um, everyone is around the table. They understand the pressures or challenges or opportunities that you are referring to, and um, they're real. And I think that's that is something that government is fully aware of and, and fully invested in. 
I think just the other element to add, when I listen to kind of what you just read from, I can see a point being made from the minister that leadership is around the housing component and workforce is around Minister Redmond's kind of portfolio, but the, the integration and that cross-collaboration happens across the civil service. So, you know, it's hard to tell from a media story that piece, but I do think that there's significant cross-collaboration that happens. Peter Bab Baker? Yeah, I'm fair, and I obviously I have questions to the appropriate ministers to ask as well, and, the, and they will come. Um, one of the other integrated parts of this, and um, I think it was, I think it was you, Mary, you mentioned at Holland College, they've doubled the intake of their carpentry programs there. And there was just a, another uh, piece, media piece this morning on the fact that we don't have licensing of builders and roofers here. And it's my understanding, and I spoke to Sandy McDonald about this uh, just before the last election, that yes, the programs have expanded, but they're actually not filled because why would I go to school to do something I can do without having to be licensed? So that's another um, perhaps element of a lack of integration here. And I'm wondering whether you've spoken, I'm sure you have, with the folks at Holland College and other post-secondary institutions. And and our high schools as well, in order for you, I think you also said, Mary, and I agree with you wholeheartedly, that it's never too soon to embark on a trades career. And in high school, um, providing credits to high school students who show an interest and an aptitude towards the trades at an early, I think it's a really important um, tie-in that we can have with Holland College, for example. And I'm wondering whether you have spoken to Sandy about the fact that those programs are not full and what government could do to change that? So the first part of your question around licensing of builders, contractors, that has been in the media and, and I think, you know, for us, we look at what is the issue that's at the forefront and it was around that consumer protection requirement. So I, I you know, obviously justice and, and inspection services are looking into this component. Um, you know, we have looked at does this exist currently in Canada and, and we've reached out very quickly in Atlantic Canada, it doesn't. I think our element is looking at what is the skill requirement around this type of, um, you know, if government was to take a legislative approach, what does that look like as far as trades? So, you know, right now it, it if the issue is the consumer protection piece, there is legislation that's in place with other departments to take the lead on that. As far as your, so my conversations would happen with officials at Holland College and I can tell you, um, we are very fortunate to have the deputy minister who used to be the VP of academics. Um, and we also have strong uh, relationships with Holland College where we talk about their enrollment levels and we would not be seeing seats where we're concerned that are not currently being occupied in that growth plan. So, you know, just last week we were talking about, you know, are we, where are we with our overall student numbers? So I can certainly follow up to see, but, you know, my biggest fear is having seats not filled in areas that have um, strong workforce growth plans and construction trades would definitely be one of those. So we can follow up on that. Thanks. All right. I'll give you one more if you want, Peter. Okay. Um, <laughs> Be fair here. <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna I'm gonna get a little nerdy here and talk about some statistics. Um, the 2,050 families I think Jeff mentioned yep. were, was the provincial allocation from the federal government this year, um, and I believe you said that translates to. 3,200 individuals? The multiplier is about 1.8 for our programs, is about 1.8 uh, individuals per family that we support through our office. Okay. All right. So, um, again, our clearly our average family statistics are, are different, and I'm not sure, and Mayor, you mentioned earlier, this is, I'm getting to the source of my question. You mentioned earlier that um, sometimes the statistics, you know, somebody may become a permanent resident or a Canadian citizen. Um, and my question is, when folks are here and they're not permanent residents or Canadian citizens, do they show up in our population numbers? So... 
this question is really best suited for the statistics side of government. I know they were here today presenting, but I can tell you, you will see temporary numbers when you look at the components of growth. You will you will see non-permanent residents noted. I think the element that may not be like is harder to capture is that transition rate between temporary and permanent. And, you know, we, we talk about international students and, and others that the pathway to permanent residency and becoming a component of that permanent growth can be long. We've talked about that, where it can be up to four years before somebody is a permanent resident and they are what we would deem well established in our province. So those numbers are noted um, in the population. Numbers. Can I just ask a clarifying thing sure. here? Sure. So yeah. when last year, for example, when we had 7,000 and something, yeah, thanks, sorry, Cord, um, uh, New Islanders, would would that number include these temporary residents that you've just described, Mary? I think we would need to get you some information back okay. on the specifics. I think we could definitely tell you we know we have more temporary residents in the population than what is showing in the components of growth data based on tracking out labor market impact assessments with employers, how many open, how many are here, our international student population numbers with our post-secondary institutions, and then individual families that would be through the Office of Immigration. And, and that's a trend across Canada too. Yeah. Yeah. Other provinces are seeing increases in their non-permanent resident Resident. populations as well. Yeah, it is becoming a a trend across Canada. The reason I asked was so that we are using accurate data to project, Mm -hmm. for example, how many doctors, how many houses, how many roads, whatever. Yeah, we we can get that information from uh, Economic Stats Bureau, but you'll see in there there's obviously births, deaths, and all the levers there. You'll see international immigration, but you'll also see the non-permanents there. Um, And then you'll see uh, um, Canadians returning as well, or, or, or to back to the province as well. So there's different levers there, and you'll see that, and we can send you that graph. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks. Gord McNeely. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's funny, because uh, the honorable member mentioned the housing minister, and a quote, and it's, it's, it's odd, because um, he's the chairperson of a new cabinet committee on housing, and the vice chairperson is, is your minister. So if, if we knew enough to put them together and have them as a vice chairperson, you'd think that he would be up to speed on the housing or the, the population. So. so I think, though, look at the point in time. I can tell you that we have been called into that committee and we are now providing data to that committee. But when you look at the point in time of when that structure was at place and when the terms of reference was being developed, so I, I just think it's reflective of a whole bunch of elements on the timing of that. Yeah. And I guess from, from this side of things, we'd just be like, we'd look at the disjointedness of it, and that's our kind of job is to take what we're hearing on the ground and what we're hearing um, and, and bring that forward, because I, I think this problem has been more or less disjointed, and I'll, I'll make a, a comment or I'll talk about international students right now to, to and, and that program there. In your slides, it has sense of belonging from arrival. Um, desire to stay in the province, and I can't get I can't get around the fact that the, the students that I'm talking to are marginalized, living poor, have no place to live, and the the supports that they receive are disjointed. They're not there, and we're saying that we're going to make them part of our strategy moving forward. This is what I'm seeing and hearing on the ground: some sad stories about how people are are living in in Prince Edward Island, and it's not it's not. Your fault. It's it's the whole thing. I, I was hopeful that the new resident was res, residence was going to be built. The problem was going to go away. It's not. It's it's still on the ground. People are living in extreme poverty here in Prince Edward Island. And if we want to get to where this document says, we have to make sure we're talking to the international student uh, body over there, student council, all these different places. So. What are we doing to really say that, hey, you know what, we want to have a sense of belonging, because that's what I want, that's what I live, that's what I, that's, that's there. But it, we're so far removed from that statement. How do we get there? 
<laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so I'll start. I know uh, three weeks ago on a Friday evening, our Immigration and Refugee Services Agency had a presentation on surveying that they were doing around supports. And I, I think the piece for us, you're right, we do see individuals coming to the province who are struggling with some of those infrastructure pieces. Government's role, and I know there was one slide that got presented on where we were a decade ago around support for temporary residents in the province and where we are now. Yeah. And that support would include, you know, some of the entities that Cal referenced around URSA, Community Navigators, Atlantic Student Development Association, you know, the suggestion of not being engaged with the international communities, Jeff has staff that would be on present on campuses yeah. to hear that voice. So that voice is extremely important to us. There is, when we had the slide that showed who, you know, the ultimate approval for a study permit rests with the federal government, and they do look at an individual's ability to economically establish without government support during that term in school. Yeah. So I think our goal is to try to remove barriers to the workforce, create the environment for the sense of belonging, know from our collaboration of what those key issues are, and strategically address things that are within our control, and raise things to the federal government that we see as a challenge for our population group. So, you know, I know we too hear from individuals yeah. that are concerned about access to service, and both Cal's division and my division have increased support to our, our our partners to be able to buffer that um, voice that we're hearing and really be present with our organizations and our schools so that they recognize the service elements that do exist. I'm so glad to hear that um, because it is like, and there's good programs, like the student union at the UPI offers a, a fu emergency funding and it's there, and, but, but what, what you find is that people they don't know where to find things so easily, and they, they might they might be struggling with their mental health. Like some, like even listening to their stories stress me out. Like it's it's unbelievable what they have to go through. So those are the things. Like if there's an opportunity to look for more funding, because we're at an emergency kind of level right now. Um, so I, I want I want to see that happen in, in the in the future for sure. Maybe yeah. just another point, and Jeff may want to weigh in from a. In the Office of Immigration Perspective, but the study and state program that Mary alluded to, uh, as largest intake this year, and then those are international students in their graduating year, but they've also launched a uh, student professional for those in their undergrad years as well, understanding the, the gaps there and really want to make sure that they have that connection as well and, and getting those supports mm -hmm. uh, at the, at the post-secondary institutions. Also through, mentioned the Gender Equity, Diversity, Inclusion program last year, we provided uh, funding for uh, work integrated learning bursaries. Uh, right now the school, uh, UPI, was only getting funding for domestic students uh, for bursaries. Now we had provided some funding for work, work integrated learning for uh, international students. So there's a lot happening. I think this is the evolution that we're seeing and, and the needs out there. And Jeff may want to allude yeah. to some of the work that you're doing. Yeah, no, I guess I'll, I'll just kind of echo what Mary and Cal said, but you know, as I said in my presentation, we kind of get involved near the tail end of their study, but we do meet with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And, you know, I know that our staff have heard some of these stories, and we do our best to direct them to the appropriate supports that, that we know are there. I know also we've, we've been sitting on some uh, federal and provincial tables lately with regards to discussions around the international student program, and um, most jurisdictions have kind of expressed similar things that they're seeing in their, their provinces. And... Um, you know, we've made the federal government aware that this is an issue That's in PEI yeah. as other provinces have, and, and we're hopeful that, you know, maybe they can assist in some matter. But, yeah, our staff are actively kind of directing traffic wherever they can to, to, to find appropriate supports for individuals that are, you know, yeah. in, in hard times. Great. I'm, yeah. I'm glad to hear that. One more? Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I appreciate that because it's it, this. that's the question that kind of just makes me, you know, it's, it's a difficult one. Um, this morning in public accounts, we, we heard from we heard about your international recruitment to Saudi Arabia or was it, um, Dubai. Dubai. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah so uh, 31. And I asked some questions on that. 31 um, nurses. Well, I found out this morning that it's, it's gone down to 27. I understand there's a couple of people that that might not choose to, to do it. But in the press release, it said later this year or 
in, in 2024. And then I asked about, um, they said there was a nine month window that, that people have to wait to, to do the international side of things. It's 27 healthcare workers yeah. that, that we have to wait nine months for to fill out paperwork. Is there anything, and I asked the same question, is there anything that we can do? Do you feel like, can we, can we lobby as a province to speed that up? We need healthcare professionals in Prince Edward Island, and they're waiting because somebody's screening them in yeah. some other place. I don't understand it. Is there anything that we can do, and would that be, a, what, how, how do you feel about that, that wait, that gap? So thanks for the question. Appreciate that. And yeah, that, that is one of the biggest challenges with uh, international immigration. Are uh, you know, I'll point the finger at my federal colleagues. Our federal federal processing times are, are long, um, and and that's it is a frustration for employers. It's a frustration for our office. I guess speaking specifically towards this this mission and these healthcare workers, we have tried to do everything we can to uh, expedite the process. So for example. Um, our office, and again, some of these, some of the delays are sometimes out of the control of our office or even the federal government, because a lot of it depends on how much time it takes for an applicant to get their application in with us. So sometimes it can be the individual in Dubai, it takes them a while to get their affairs squared away, it takes them a while to get the paperwork gathered that they need to apply. So that can be part of the delay. When we're getting the application into our office, I've instructed our staff to put them all to the very top, so they are expedited. They are first in, for, last in, first out in those cases for those healthcare workers. We've also developed, um, in consultation with the embassy in Dubai, um, for this specific mission that we did, we're including a letter um, with that the applicant, the individual, can send with their application for their work permit to the embassy in Dubai. That will inform them that they were recruited as part of this mission that was sponsored by the province PEI, the employer health PEI was present and did the, you know, just to try to cut out some of that, that screening that they may otherwise do. So, so we have taken steps to try to expedite the processing from what it normally would be. Good. Good I think maybe just to add to that, the one element is, um, you know, that assessment that is being done by the federal government is to protect public safety as well. So as Jeff said, the individual kind of controls, you know, asking someone to move their family across the world to integrate into a jurisdiction does take time and that duration of time that it takes for an individual to get all of their documents to be able to, you know, uh, meet that requirement around criminality, education assessments. So there's the work up front that's happening at the same time where if it's a regulated occupation, we've heard regulators are working extremely hard to expedite that educational assessment component, but also they, they have to ensure the public safety pieces. So I, I look at it as all of the systems working together on that pathway. I think we, we need to be cautious of the timing um, in separate pieces because there's a lot more integration happening of all of that. And a lot of the times it is the individual side as to when they submit and when that clock starts too. Um, and I, I did want to ask a couple of questions as well. Um, first of all, just to make sure I'm talking to the right people. Are you the uh, department responsible for lobbying the federal government uh, for any employment insurance changes, EI issues? Yes, we are. Okay. Um, so my question, I, the perception is that there's an underground economy out there and it's related to EI. I'll say the perception. I'm going to pursue this line of questioning at my own peril. <laughs> and uh, I wondered, first of all, if the, the numbers you have in your presentation um, take into a, account the work that's being done as part of this underground economy. I would assume no, but I thought I would ask. So, great question. I think our position around employment insurance modernization, because that is what it is being called, is to ensure that there are no barriers that prevent people from successfully integrating into the workforce. So, you know, we're looking at um, the qualification hours, we're looking at pilots that used to exist that would encourage and not penalize people to actually work 
while they're on claim. Those are kind of our strategic positions around this are trying to look at barriers that would prevent that successful integration. Um, we do work very closely with the federal government on, you know, we monthly get reports on um, employment insurance claimant data and what that looks like in each regional area of PEI. We're looking at age and demographic information of where can we invest to try to make that um, that integration quicker so that a new claimant is well aware of the opportunities. We work with the federal government on things like, uh, you know, uh, taglines that when someone applies for EI, they're aware of work PEI and careers that exist in our province and opportunities. So, um, yes, we are the department that is around that table, and our position on this is to try to assist and promote that early intervention. Um, around connecting to the workforce. Um, and, and I guess what I was going to do, you have, do you have any estimates uh, that you have done as, as the experts in this area um, as to what percentage of the work being done in our province or what, how much workforce is actually involved in that? So like what's the contribution of that underground economy workforce to, say, our construction sector, because that's what we're talking about? So uh, underground economy or suggestion of would yes. be a hard data <laughs> component <laughs> for us to be able to get a handle on. I think, um, are we looking at the caseloads by naked industry to make sure that we're not seeing trends that would counter kind of our strategic direction that we're trying to go in? Yes. I think, um, you know, th that would be where our investments are. I don't you know, I, I would hope today that, um, you know, that um, underground economy isn't as predominant, um, so maybe it's not, um, but from a data perspective, we wouldn't have any way of capturing that, okay. that I'm aware of. Well, well th thank you, and, and it, is, it, is, it is a really tough one, I'm, by, by very definition, it's an underground economy, so how are you supposed to collect stats on it? But I think it's a... Uh, it's a, a potential uh, source of, of workforce, and it and you did mention that you are working to identify uh, EI modernization as one way to, to to help put people you know into back into the workforce potentially that we're on EI and that sort of thing. But, yeah, I, I think there's um, a number of indicators around this yeah. that you have to look at. You have to look at the fact that our employment numbers are higher than what they've ever been. You have to look at our our creation around full time um, positions. The uh, CEF data on payroll information. So, you know, sector by sector, right. we're looking at all of the different and elements that suggest our our workforce is growing. And, and that's where I'm going. It it is a perception at this point, I think, because yeah, it's it's hard to, to to put any any numbers on it per se. So I I guess uh, in this pursuit of of ER modernization. Um, as, as a department, are, are you lobbying hard for things like reducing the, the clawbacks associated with EI when people work? You mentioned that's on the table. Is that something you're aggressively pursuing? And do you think there's an opportunity there? Is that something that's on, on your agenda that you are, are working to, to make changes towards? Yeah, so I, I think the key areas for us is removing any disincentive that's currently in place around workforce. I think it is, you know, looking at some areas of the population, whether it be gig economy or precarious workers who were never eligible for employment insurance. And, you know, if, if you look back to the, the pandemic and, and what they faced, they didn't have opportunities for any sort of sen a safety net in place. So we would be um, certainly positioning the eligibility component as well as disincentives and focusing in on, on that. I, I do know, you know, there's been significant engagement that the federal government has had through the Employment Insurance Commission with the employer and employee commissioner have been in our province recently engaging on both workforce and individuals around EI modernization. And our table that we have with the federal government would be providing our provincial input into those topics. Okay, thank you very much. It's a, it's a tough topic without having, you know, it's all conjecture, really, I suppose, at some point. Um, is there anybody else that has any questions? All right. Well, thank you 
so much for, for coming in today. It was a, a broad set of topics and very important uh, issues that your department looks at for our province. And, and you did, did a, a fantastic presentation and a great job answering the questions. So um, I think we'll just have a, a quick recess before new business. And uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Thanks. you. Let's call this meeting back to, to order, and uh, we're on item number four, new business. Um, does anybody have any new business? All right. Well, seeing as we have no new business, then a call for adjournment. Bob Henderson. Thank you. Meeting adjourned.